coming is yav, uh, Yavo. And Yavo does mean coming, come, to come. And so it was Yavo U, or Yavo O, one of the two, which means his coming. But that's not the correct word. The word is really Hophia, and it's, it's used, I didn't even know where it was in the scriptures. One of these songs I had for years, the other one I just wrote yesterday, the last one, and this word Hophia comes from Yafa, which means beautiful. And it literally means bright shining, like the word Zion. It's the same basic meaning as Zion. And Yafa means pretty or beautiful. And that's where this word comes from. So, we are in the last day of Moshe's life. What's the date? September. Nope, not today. Adar? What's the date? <laughs> Adar? Adar what? Seven. Very good. Adar seven. It's the last day of uh, Moshe's life, hours before he dies. And he sings them a song at the age of 120. And he teaches it to them. So they'll never forget it. And their generations after them will never forget it. So we're going to pick out... I believe, well, there's two slides. I believe we're going to look at three different parts of this long song, and that's it. It starts out, give ear, you heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Now, that's a weird thing to say, because he calls the earth and the heavens, sorry, the heavens and the earth as his witnesses. Two witnesses. You know, it says in the scriptures uh, that... You can be killed on the word of one witness, right? Right? No. I don't know. No. no two or three yeah. You are correct. It says in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you can't put somebody to death except by the word of two or three witnesses. Now, the whole purpose of this song is about the day of the Lord, the birth pangs. And it says over and over in the song, in days to come, in the future, when you turn to idolatry, the heaven and the earth are going to remember what they heard in this song, and they're going to be the witnesses to, we'll get to that in a while, to be the, the judge, the judges. May my teaching drip as the rain, and my speech trickle as the dew, as droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the vegetation. For I proclaim the name of Yehovah, Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, it's Hatsur. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Now, I mean, he's, you know, saying all this stuff that sounds good. And basically, what, he's getting ready to ream them. Now, he's done this five times before on the last day of his life. All of the book of Deuteronomy is on the last day of his life. And on the last day of his life, he reams them five times. This is the fifth. So, it, he always starts out, just jumps in and goes, you rebels, you this, you that. Not this time. This time, he starts out by saying all this good stuff. It's wonderful, God is just, he's magnificent. And then he, he goes in on And he really starts, you know, to, to rebuke them. A God of faithfulness without injustice, righteous and just is he. And then he turns. They've acted corruptly against him. They're not his children for their defect, but a perverse and crooked generation. Is this what you do to the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Those are harsh, harsh words. Is this how you treat Yehovah? Really hard. He's not your father who is... Is he not your father who's purchased you? He has made you and established you. Remember the days of old. Now these words are really, they mean a lot to me because God himself spoke this to me. I, I learned in Judaism, this was like after I was a believer only a couple years, and I saw in the writings of the sages that God spoke in tongues at Mount Sinai, at Shavuot. I had never heard that from any Messianic rabbi or Messianic teacher or Messianic Jew, ever. And I was like, what? That can't be true. And so I, I tried to figure out, okay, the rabbis say that God spoke in the 70 languages. Who's, wait, where did they get this from? And nobody could answer my question. So I came across this verse. 
that says, ask your father. And I, and I did. I asked God, what, what are they talking about? Where does this come from? I asked God, ask your father and he'll tell you. And he did. And I felt like this was kind of tongue in cheek of God. Ask your elders and they'll tell you. I did ask my elders. Nobody knew a thing about this. Nobody. And then, I kept reading, and it said, When the Most High gave the Gentiles their inheritance, he separated the sons of Adam. He set their boundaries, the boundaries of all the nations, according to the number of the sons of Israel. So I thought, well, that's 12. So why, why aren't there 12 nations, Gentiles? The rabbis say there's 70. Where did they get this from? And then I found it. It's in Exodus chapter 1. It says that all the people that came from Jacob came to Egypt. They were 70 in number. That's what it says. And that's what God was referring to here. He set... Now listen to this. This is, this is like sets up the entire teaching for today. He set the boundaries of all the nations by what? What was the judge, the criteria of, the, of this boundaries? The number of Israel. Say it again. The number of Israel. The number of the sons of Israel. How many are the number of the sons of Israel? Seventy. Exodus chapter 1. There were seventy who came from Jacob, from Israel. Right? It looks like you're not tracking what I'm saying. Same guy. So, there are 70 sons of Israel. That's what it says. B'nai Israel. And so God set boundaries of all the Gentiles according to the number of who? The who? Sons of Israel. Israel. Israel is the judge of all the nations. And it says it here. It, it's, I know it's veiled. But this is what God set up. In Genesis chapter 10, it lists all 70 nations for us. Genesis chapter 10. But that's not when it happened. It happened in Exodus 1, when there were then counted 70 from Jacob. And right then and there, when they came to Egypt, God said, that's how many nations there's going to be. Why? Because that's how many Israel is. And so... And this is basically the whole teaching today. God's criteria, like, like his legal book, like a, a lawyer goes to legal books and they try to find like the uh, precedent and the criteria for what to apply to this court case. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, the legal book is Israel. Israel, 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 Israel. And if it's to and about and for Israel, it applies to the Gentiles. Therefore, how the Gentiles treat Israel is how God treats them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this is not a small thing. It's not like, I will bless those who bless you. It's not that. But that's, that's the very, very tip of the iceberg. This is so much bigger. So much so that the entire criteria of what we know as the birth pains, but with the church calls the tribulation, the entire criteria for it is all about Israel. That's why it's called in Hebrew, Hevle HaMashiach, the birth pains of Messiah. Israel gives birth to the Messiah. It's all about Israel. And so this is very, very, very important that God, God set up the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of sons of Israel. And God taught me this. Because I went to all the Messianic rabbis. These were my buddies. They were all my buddies. These are the people I grew up with. And I went to all of them and I asked them and they, nobody had an answer. You know, we don't know what we don't know. I didn't know either. And so God himself showed me. And then it says this, for the Lord's portion. It's a portion. Peace, but what kind of peace? Of something big? No, it's a portion that's assigned to you. 
like like if you're cooking steaks for everybody, and I say I want I want a ribeye, and I want it to be uh, 12 ounces. You don't then go to the grill and grab me a T-bone that's five ounces. It's a specific set-apart portion, yes? Mm -hmm. And it's assigned to each person. And that's, well, what's God's portion? What's his assigned piece? Israel. Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance, of God's inheritance. So God has an inheritance, not just us, not just Israel. What's God's inheritance? These people that treat him like garbage. That's God's inheritance. His nasty, willful, uncontrollable children. Those, that's God's inheritance. All right, on to another thing. And he will say, this is another portion of the psalm. It's farther on, toward the end. And he's, he will say, where is their God? Elohim, their God. Where is their God? Elohim, the rock in which they took refuge. Now what it's talking about is not their God, the God's plural. Their false God. Where is their false God? The, the rock in which they took refuge. Those who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. So he's talking about demons that they offered uh, drink offerings and, and sacrifices to. That the Jews offered drink offerings and sacrifices to these demons. And so he's mocking the Jews, saying, Where, where's their gods? Where are they? That they gave all this stuff to. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your protection. See now that I, I am he, and there's no Elohim that stands like me. I put to death, I give life, I've wounded, and it's me who heals. And there's nobody who can save from my hand. Indeed, I raise my hand to heaven. I raise my hand to heaven. God raises his hand. What does that mean? God raises his hand to heaven. That's weird, isn't it? God's everywhere. He's a spirit. He lives in heaven, sort of. He lives in a temple, sort of. In Jerusalem, sort of. And he raises his hand to heaven and swears. So, the reason he talks like this, anthrop anthropomorphically, which means like in human, like as if he's a human, is so that we can understand what he's saying. That's all. That's all it is. He's saying, look, I raise my hand to heaven and I'm swearing to you, Israel. Because that's like a human action. Right, because it's a human action and maybe they can understand yeah, that. Yes, maybe. they can interpret it. Exactly. And that's why he's saying it. He says, I raise my hand to heaven. So what he's going to say here is extremely, extremely important. He's making an oath to himself that cannot be broken. And guess what it's about? Israel. The birth pains. It's all about the birth pains. Isn't that weird? The one thing, and by the way, he, he never does this anywhere else. He never says, I raise my hand to heaven and I swear. He never does that anywhere else. And it's only about the birth pains. And he says this. So that's why it's so important in my view. I raise my hand to heaven and I say, as I live forever, when I have sharpened the lightning of my sword, and my hand takes hold of justice, I will return vengeance. Now this is the word. I'm teaching you two words today. Hofa, hofa, hofia. Well, there's a different way to say it. Hofa, ah, hofa, to, hofia. We'll say hofia. Say hofia. 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 That means the coming or the shining forth. And then there's this word. You need to know this word. Nakam. Nakam. Different ways to say it. Different, uh, you know, uh, tenses of the of the word. The the main tense, the root tense is nakam. And it literally means vengeance. Nobody talks about this. Nobody talks about vengeance. Here's why. Jesus is the God of love. You're supposed to love people. You're supposed to, and the Pope just said, you know, you're supposed to open up your, your, your nation to the re refugees. Show love. Why? 
Because he's the representative of Christ on earth. And Christ is the God of love. This has been going on for 2,000 years. We're not going to change it. But the truth is, God manifested in the form of Yeshua, a rabbi. And he was the God of love. He got a bunch of cords and he made a whip. And he whipped people out of the temple because they were doing the wrong picture. And he rebuked his brothers. And he yelled at them. And he screamed at them. And, he, and that's love. But he never showed vengeance. That's for the birth pangs. And that's why people think Christ is the God of love. Because he never showed vengeance. It's for the birth pangs only. God only shows vengeance in the birth pangs. And that's what we're going to look at. So this word, nakah, here, he says, I swear by me living forever that I am going to bring nakah. That's what he's saying. It's the only time he ever did it. Think about that. The only time he swore by himself that he's going to show vengeance on my enemies and finish those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain of the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. Rejoice, you nations, with his people for the blood of his servants for the blood of his servants. Who's that? Israel. Israel. For the blood of his servants, Israel, God will avenge. Yikum. Same word, different tense. Yikum. And vengeance. Not come. He said it three times. I will return vengeance. He will avenge and vengeance return on his adversaries. And he will atone. There's the word kippur. So therefore, listen to what I'm saying. He's telling us that in order for there to be, listen to what I'm saying. In order for there to be atonement, what does there have to be? Vengeance. Vengeance. Not come. In order for there to be atonement at all, there has to be nakam, vengeance. You get what I'm saying? Yep. Now this is what Rashi says about when he says, listen, O heavens. Listen, O heavens, that I'm warning Israel, and you shall be witnesses in this matter. Who shall be witnesses? The heavens. The heavens and, and, the earth. and the earth. For I've already told Israel that you will be witnesses. And so, and let the earth hear. Now, why did Moshe call upon heaven and earth to be witnesses? And for, you know, for warning Israel. Moses said, look, I'm just flesh and blood. I might be dead tomorrow. Why would he say I might be dead tomorrow? Because he's going to be dead tomorrow. What's the date? I got seven. Adar 7. This is the day he, this is his last day on earth. And he will be dead tomorrow. I'm just flesh and blood. Tomorrow I die. If Israel says we never accepted the covenant, who's going to come and refute them? I'm not going to be around and do it. Therefore he called upon heaven and earth as witnesses for Israel, witnesses that endure. Furthermore, if they, Israel, act meritoriously, the witnesses come and reward them. The vine will give its fruit, and the earth will yield its produce. Who are the witnesses? Heaven and earth. So here, who's, who's, uh, who's rewarding them? The vine will give its fruit, the earth will yield its produce. Heaven or earth? Earth. It says earth. The earth will yield its produce. And the heavens will give their due. And there's the other witness. That's from Zechariah 8. And if Israel acts sinfully, the hand of the witnesses will be first upon them to punish them. To, to inflict punishment. And he will close off the heaven that there be no rain and the soil will not give its produce. As it said in Deuteronomy 11, three Torah portions ago that we read. And then the verse continues, and you will perish quickly through the attacks of the nations. So what he's doing is he's saying, of course he calls the two witnesses heaven and earth. Because the witnesses are first 
to do the punishment, right? Is that correct? Yes. You sure? Where does it say that? We don't know. Anybody know? Okay. That's what I was afraid of, so I included it. Deuteronomy 17. On the mouth of two witnesses, Edim, or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death, and he shall not be put to death on the mouth of one witness. The hand of the witnesses will be first against him to put him to death. The hand of the witnesses are the first ones to put to death. Okay? Now, I didn't know if I was going to need to go into this, but I clearly did. Yes? So, I, I'm going a little bit further, but the witnesses, heaven and earth, they're like the two witnesses, uh, like the Moses and Elijah. Yes, they're like the two witnesses, Moshe and Eliyahu, Moses and Elijah, Moses which is the Moses the and the prophets. Right, so it's like Moses would be like the earth. I'm sorry. Moses and Elijah is like the Torah. They okay. are the Torah and the prophets. So, one is heaven and one is earth. Which one is which? Uh, the heavens are the prophets. And the heavens and are the prophets and, and Torah, Torah is and the earth. earth. How do we know that? Because God says in the Psalms, the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth I've given to the, the sons of men. The earth belongs to us. Torah was given to us on earth. Yes? Yeah. But the heavens are the heavens of the Lord. So, Moshe is like the earth, and Eliyahu is like the heavens. Now, don't lose this, okay? Who's the first one, we'll say stoning, who's the first one to throw the stone? The witnesses. The witnesses, plural. Plural. Has to be two or three, yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is what people picture when they think of stoning. I can't do anything about what you have in your head unless I change it. So I'm going to try to change this. This is disgusting. This is, by the way, the best piece of art done in biblical illustration. Uh, this was by an English guy from the 1880s. He, he illustrated the entire Bible, and he did beautiful, beautiful work. His name is Tissot, T-I-S-S-O-T, -S -S James Tissot. Beautiful work, and every one of them is wrong. Every one of them is disgusting because he just went along with what most people believe. And it's, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. So this is what most people think. They, they picture stoning, and it's been in all the movies like this, like a bunch of cavemen throwing rocks at a dude. And that's what they look like. And look at this guy with the one over his head. <laughs> like a barbarian. Every image in art makes the Jews appear like a gang of cavemen. The brutality of mob rule. Mob rule. And that's how it always is portrayed. So I thought, you know, just for fun, I'll show you what it was really like. You want to see what it was really like? Stoning? Yeah. yeah. It's going to surprise you. We're going to read this whole thing. It's three pages. <laughs> we'll go through it fast. When a trial ends in a guilty verdict, when a what ends? Trial. Where's the caveman? Yeah, trial is like civil. Right. And it has to be done in a certain way in Judaism. When a trial ends in a guilty verdict and the condemned man has been sentenced to be stoned, he is taken out to the place of stoning, which was outside the court and a little bit beyond. And it, as it is stated about a blasphemer, take him who is cursed outside the camp and let all that heard him lay their hands on his head. Where's the caveman? They, everybody, everybody who heard him goes and lays their hands on his head. And it's not to try to break his neck. It's to lay their hands on his head to pray for him. Lay their hands on his head. You know, like, like when we put our sins on the animal in a sacrifice. To pray for ourselves. Um, let's see. Put their hands on his head and let all the congregation, and then let all the congregation stone him. That's in Leviticus 24. But you still don't know how it was done. Watch this. One man stands at the entrance to the court with cloths in his hand, and another man sits on a horse. Nowadays we use cell phones. Text me. 
be much quicker. But then they have a, have a guy with cloths in his hands, and another man sits on a horse a distance away from him, but where he can still see the guy with cloths. If one of the judges says, I can teach a reason to acquit him, everything stops. And they bring him back, and they reconvene the court, and they do it again. Where's the caveman? I can teach a, re a reason to acquit him. The man with the cloths waves at them as a signal to the man on the horse. The horse races off after the court agents who are leading the condemned to his execution. He stops them. They wait until the court determines if the arguments have merit. Even if the condemned man says, you know what, I can teach a reason why I'm innocent. They do the same thing. They bring the guy back. They reconvene. They find out if he has merit. Even up to five or six times. While they're taking him back out, he may think, oh, you know what? The Torah says this, guys, and then they bring him back, and they do it again. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot this. They bring him back, because they're seeking for a way to restore. They're not, it's not, there's no mob rule, ever, in Judaism. They're seeking for a way to restore. He stops them, they wait until the court determines if the argument has substance. Even if the condemned man says, I can teach a reason to acquit him, he's returned to the courthouse even four or five times, provided that there is substance to his words. If he's returned to the court and judges find a reason to acquit, they acquit, they release him immediately. Done. But if they don't find a reason to acquit, he goes out to be stoned. And a crier goes before him and publicly proclaims, making it public so everybody knows, there's no mob rule here. So-and-so, son of so-and-so, is going out to be stoned because he committed such and such a transgression. And so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are his witnesses. So now they're made public. That's so good. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Because they're going to be the first ones to stone him. You can't, you can't accuse somebody Hiding behind right. The, uh, you have to face your accuser. It's got to be all public and open. All right. Um, anyone who knows of a, anybody who knows of a reason to acquit him, come forward and teach it on his behalf. Teach it. Teach it. Scripture on his behalf. You can't just like say something. You can't just say something. You have to teach it from Judaism. I think this is amazing. I'd love to do an illustration of this. Mm. Right. When I can the, picture it in my head. <laughs> Good. When the condemned man is at a distance of about 10 cubits, that's about 15 feet, from the place of stoning, they say to him, confess your transgressions. So now he says it openly in front of everybody. I did this, I did that. As the way of all who are being executed is to confess. For whoever confesses and regrets his transgression, he has a portion in the world to come. What are they trying to do? Save him. You know that scripture that says, I, I, it's Shaul says, I prayed for the destruction of his flesh so he could be saved in the day of the Lord. This is what he's talking about. This is from Judaism. This is what how Judaism worked, and he's quoting that. You always seek a way to save, always. Not necessarily save the flesh, but save the person, save their soul. And that's what's going on here. For whoever confesses and regrets his transgression is a portion in the world to come. For so we find with regard to Achan, it's in Joshua 7, that Joshua said, But my son, please give glory to Yehovah, God of Israel, and make confession to him. And the next verse states, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against Yehovah, God of Israel. And like this and like that have I done. And from where is it derived that Achan's confession achieved atonement for him? It is stated, and Joshua said, Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will trouble you. When? This day. This day. Not that day. Not in that day. Not in the future. You troubled us now. You receive trouble now. But you're going to be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, we reading that would never get that from the text, would we? The rabbis do Joshua said to Achan as follows, On this day of your judgment you are troubled, but you will not be troubled in the world to come. And if the condemned man does not know how to confess, 
either from ignorance or out of confusion, they simply say to him, just say this, let my death be an atonement for all my sins. Rabbi Yehuda says, if the condemned man knows that he's convicted by the testimony of conspiring witnesses, in other words, he's not guilty, but some witnesses got together and made it look like he's guilty, but in fact he's innocent, he says, let my death be an atonement for all my sins except for this, because I didn't do it. The sages who disagreed with Rabbi Yehuda said to him, if so, every person who's being executed will just say that. So that's, that's not the best idea, to clear himself in the eyes of the public. So therefore, if the condemned man does not make such a statement on his own, the court does not suggest it to him as an alternative. He has to come up with it by himself. When the condemned man is at a distance of four cubits, it's about seven feet, six feet, from the place of stoning, they take off his clothes. They cover a man's genitals in the front, and the woman is covered both in front and in back. This is what Rabbi Yehuda said, but the rabbis say, a man is stone naked, wearing just that cloth covering. But a woman is not stone naked, she's stone while clothed. The place of stoning from which the condemned man is pushed to his death is a platform twice the height of an ordinary man that's about 12 feet tall, 10 to 12 feet tall. This is uh, eight feet, the ceiling. So, you know, 12 feet's pretty tall. It's a platform, 12 feet tall, something like that. And uh, he is made to stand at the edge of the platform. And then one of the witnesses who testified, one of the witnesses who testified against him. How many witnesses are there? Two, three. Two or three. One of the witnesses who testified against him pushes him down by the hips. I got a little confused here so that he falls face up onto the ground. So in other words, if, like, if I'm the, 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 the witness and the condemned guy is standing, he's facing me. Yeah. And I push him and he goes into the, you know, falls off the platform, falls backward onto his back. Why? Which way is he facing? Uh, heaven, right. He's facing heaven. So, in other words, the, the, the judgment comes from where? Heaven. Heaven. It's rocks. Right? Stony. It's rocks. But he's looking up at heaven. And so the judgment is coming from heaven. Yes? Couldn't it also be that sometimes they can die twice? Uh, I don't want to go there. That, that's not bad, actually. Um, he falls face up onto the ground. If he turned over onto his chest when he was falling with his face downward, the witness then has to go down and flip him over so he's facing heaven. And if he dies, where, where, where is the mob rule here? Where's the caveman? <laughs> Throwing sad. rocks like an abominable snowman or something. A lot of patience going on. Yeah. Yes, it's a lot of very patience. Very specific. Very specific and very precise. Um, if he dies, if he dies thank you. If he dies through falling to the ground, so he could die just from the fall, the obligation to stone the transgressor is fulfilled. Already done. And if the condemned man does not die from his fall, the second witness takes the stone that has been prepared for this task. And unfortunately, That's how big the stone was. Unfortunately, that's accurate. The, the painting is so completely inaccurate. But see the so guy the with stone. the big stone over his head? That's the stone he's talking about. That's like that thing right there. Yeah, it's big. And it's, it's the only thing that's accurate in this horrible painting. The only thing. The size of that stone. I mean, look at the condemned down at the bottom trying to cover his head looking down to the earth. It's everything's wrong, everything. So it says, if the, condemned, if, if the condemned man doesn't die from his fall, the second witness takes the stone that has been prepared for this task and places or casts it onto his chest. Yeah. Yeah, mind you, they're like 10, 12 feet up. So that's just like dropping on you, that's pretty good. 
<laughs> and, if, and if he dies with the casting of this first stone, the obligation to stone the transgressor, transgressor is fulfilled. And if he doesn't die with the casting of this stone, which has happened, then his stoning is completed by all the other Jewish people. That is, by all the people who assembled for the execution. As it is stated, the hand of the witnesses shall be first to put him to death, and then the hand of all the people. Yeah, so, because you see in like the movies and stuff, they're always like screaming and shouting right. and like eager to like mob, kill this guy. Mob so, rule. Mob yeah. rule. This is the way of the Gentiles. I'm sorry to tell you, but it is. Mob rule is the way of the Gentiles. It was never, it is never, it never will be the way of Israel or the Jew. So I want to go back to our initial idea. Give ear, you heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Those are the two witnesses, heaven and earth. Yes? Yeah. And heaven and earth will be the ones to do what? The to bless yeah. or to curse Israel. Yes? Yeah. All right, they're the first ones that they put their hand first to the job. And we read in Devarim 11, if you will listen with hearing to my mitzvot, which I'm setting up for you today, to love the Lord, to serve Him with all your heart, I will give rain in its time, early rain, latter rain, and you'll gather in your grain. Is this heaven or earth? Heaven. That's from heaven. Rain is from heaven. And then the earth will give grain and wine and oil, etc. And then in Deborah 11, 27, it says, If you listen to the meats folk, I will give you what? Oh my God. If you listen to the meat's vote, I will give you what? Blessings. Blessing. If you do not listen to the meat's vote, I will give you what? The curse. The curse. If the blessing, if you listen to the meat's vote of the Lord your God, the curse, if you don't listen to the meat's vote. So you can do the meat's vote all day long and not get the blessing. The blessing is from hearing the things you do, not from doing it. It's from hearing the things that you do. And if you do it, but you don't hear it, sorry, but that, that brings, why, that like brings says, a curse. That right. brings a curse. Listen to me again. You can do the Jewish stuff all day long, but if you don't hear the Jewish stuff, unfortunately, it brings the curse. The curse of the law. And it puts you in bondage. Is that why like, it says... Um, I can't quote like exactly, but it says like the people they'll cry out and be like, oh, but like we healed people in your name and we did all the good We're things. We're coming to that. Yeah. <laughs> I figured, the, but yeah, I figured. Yeah, well, that's at the end of the season. Very good though. You're tracking properly. All right. So and then Leviticus 26, we saw three or four Torah portions ago. Leviticus 26 says, I will make your heavens like iron and I will make your earth like bronze. The heaven and the earth are the witnesses. So he's saying, if you don't listen to the meat's vote, I'll make the heavens like iron. That's one of the witnesses. And I'll make the earth, the other witness, like bronze. But then he flips it in Deuteronomy 28 and says the same thing, only flips it. And he says, the heaven which is over your head will be like bronze and the earth will be like iron. But it's still the same. They will be iron and bronze, the earth and the heaven. Your two witnesses. All right? And we looked in that. We saw that uh, in Daniel that it said that the, the big giant statue had a head of gold. Who was that? Babylon. Come on, stay with me. Who is the head of gold? Babylon. Babylon. Who is the chest and iron of the chest and, and uh, arms of silver? Medo-Persia. Medo -Persia. Who was the belly and loins of bronze? Greece. Greece. So Greece is Hellenism. And that's bronze. And then what were the legs made out of? Iron. Iron. And that's Rome. Rome. All right. So the two witnesses that are first to judge or first to bless, but only blessing if you listen to the meat's folk. And this curse comes if you don't listen to the meat's phone. So he's saying, and he said over and over and over, this is all review from the last few weeks, if you listen to the meat's phone, you get what? Blessing. 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 
If you don't listen to the mitzvot, you get what? The curse. the curse. Who's the first one to give the curse? The witnesses. And the witnesses are the heaven and the earth, and they are now iron and bronze, which is, or bronze and iron, which is Greece and Rome. They're the witnesses for the curse. Does that make sense? And they're the first one to put their hand to the judgment. Did you follow that? Okay. That's it. All right. I thought you had a question. I do. Um, Mike, you were describing the armor. Is that the... There's no armor. You said the... No, it's a statue. The head is gold. Oh, Daniel. Like it's made out of gold, the whole head. The whole chest and arms are made out of silver. There's no armor. It's a naked statue. The belly and loins, the privates, are made out of bronze. The legs are made out of iron. It's in Daniel chapter 2. All right, so if we listen to the means folks speak, the two edim, the two witnesses, heaven and earth, will give to us. What will they give to us? The blessing. The blessing. If we don't <laughs> listen to the means folks, Curse. Curse. Not curse. And they'll be the first to punish. Did you follow that? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. You says the curse, the witnesses will punish, but you put them in parentheses, Helen is in the kingdom. Does that mean the punishment will be through them? Yes. Okay. The punishment will be through Hellenism, the Greco Roman Empire. But it's still alive today. Which is still in existence today. Mm -hmm. It never stopped. In fact, it's getting stronger now. Mm -hmm. And stronger and stronger every day. Until the birth pangs. So here's what Rashi says. We want to look at this again. Furthermore, if they, Israel, act meritoriously, in other words, if they listen to the meat's vote, yes? Yes. The witnesses will come and reward them. The vine will give its fruit, the earth will give its produce, and the heavens will give their due. But if if Israel does not listen to the meat's vote and act sinfully, the hand of the witnesses will be first upon them to bring the punishment. That's Greece and Rome. And he will close off the heaven, and there will be no rain, and the soil will not give its produce. So what's the punishment? Hellenism. Does that make sense? What's the punishment to us, to Israel? Hellenism. That's why it's been around for 2,000 years. Because they didn't listen to the meat's folk. Everybody thinks it's because it's they killed Christ. No, it's because they didn't listen to the meat's folk. Pure and simple. And so, the Greco-Roman Empire has been around for 2,000 years to inflict this punishment on Israel. All right, so here's what we're going to be looking at. This passage from Ha'azinu, the witnesses, the ears. When I have sharpened the lightning of my sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will return naka on my adversaries and finish those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captive from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. I wasn't going to say anything about this, but I'm going to say something about this. In art, for the last 2,000 years, in order for people to recognize that it's a biblical piece of art, the first thing they do is put long hair on the man. And then everybody looks at it and goes, oh, that's about the Bible. And just the opposite like is true. The, the the yeah, long. just the opposite is true. Jews never had and are not allowed to have long hair. If you know somebody who's doing Judaism supposedly and they have long hair, that is called in I can't remember the Hebrew word for it, but the English is a shame. And it is completely the wrong picture. Completely the wrong picture. That's why Yeshua always has long hair. Well, how long is long? Long is uh, anything that grows more than a month. 
for men. Anything men get their hair cut every month. That's what it says in the mission. Anyway, so um, that's why Yeshua always has Yeshua always has long hair in every picture, every picture, because it's Hellenism. That is Hellenism. And here in Deuteronomy, the day that that, that Moshe is going to die, he says, he says, the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. I checked this verse in five different versions of the Hebrew, of Bibles that have the Hebrew, and they translate it many different ways. But I went to the root of every word, and it literally is long-haired leaders of enemy. Literally. Just like Absalom. Yes, like Absalom. Rejoice, you Gentile. Oh! He's talking about the birth pangs and the nakab. Vengeance. And then he says, rejoice, O Gentiles. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for the blood of his servants he will avenge. Yikum, avenge. And vengeance, nakam, he will return on his enemies and will atone, keep poor for his land and his people. So this is strange. All of a sudden, he drags the Gentiles into it, and he says, get happy, with, because God's going to avenge the Jews. Why, did, why would they care? Doesn't this seem that the Gentiles are part of the body, because right after it says his people, so it's the grafted in? Yes. So what you're going to see is that, is that Gentiles who are brought into Israel are part of this, and they rejoice during the birth pains because God is avenging the Jews. Nobody else cares. No other Gentiles care. And I'm including that some believers. They don't care. They don't care about God avenging the Jews. They, are, they care about God being nice. But the truth is, and I say, I'll say it again, it's the only time in the Bible where God raised his hand and swore by the fact that he lives forever that he's going to bring vengeance. That's what he swore. Nobody wants that. Now, the word nakam means to revenge. And that's how they say it in, in Israel, by the way. Are you going to revenge him? That's how they say it. What are we going to do? Revenge somebody? I mean, we don't say that. We say, are we going to, how do we say it? Are we going to take vengeance, I think is what we say. They don't say that in Israel. They say, are you going to avenge? Are you going to vengeance somebody? Are you going to revenge somebody? And that's really the proper way to say it. To revenge, to take vengeance, to avenge oneself, to be angry or punish. So here's the whole trick. God's allowed to do that. We're not. Ever. Ever, ever, ever allowed to take vengeance on anybody. We're not allowed to revenge anybody. Not only that. And I hate to read this verse because I hate it. We're not even allowed to bear a grudge against somebody. Anybody. <laughs> Leviticus 19. Do not. Uh, or either that or just don't believe the Torah. Just don't believe the Torah. And just do what everybody does. But the Torah says, Lotikom. And there's that word, nakum. Lotikom, no vengeance. Nor bear a grudge against the sons of your people. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, that doesn't say Gentiles. I can bear a grudge against Gentiles. Well, then it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, sorry, that's out too. They're also people. They're also people. That's right. They're also your neighbor, whether you want them to be or not. And so God touches every base here. He says, no, no vengeance ever from you. That is not Israel's way. But it's also not Israel's way to bear a grudge against anybody. And that's harder. That's way harder. Way harder. And I know, I know. We don't even need to say anything about it. Everybody does it. Everybody has a trouble with bearing a grudge. So, 
After that, he's nice enough to tell us, as if we didn't know, I am the Lord. <laughs> you know, he has to tack that on the other end. So, okay. So, how does God judge for revenge? And this is really the name of the teaching. How does God judge? And we read about it. When God set the boundaries of the nations, he set them according to what? The sons of Israel. What are the number of the sons of Israel? Seventy. So that's why he made 70 nations. Because he sets, I'll say it again, the boundaries, the limits of the Gentiles according to the Jews. God's every judgment is according, you know, in that law book that he's got, it's all Israel, 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 Jews, Jews, Jews. And however the nations or the Gentiles treat the Jews, that's what's in the book, and that's how he judges. Now there's all these verses that talk about the sea and the sand. And it says in Isaiah, it says the sea rages and kicks up its dirt and garbage from the bottom of the sea, and it makes all this noise and all that, and it is the nations. And they rumble with all this noise. But the sand is there to say, you can come this far and no farther. It is the boundary of the sea. It's the sand, which is the Jewish people. Your children will be like the sand of the seashore. They are the boundary of the Gentiles. The Jews say, you come this far and no farther. This is the way of God. You can't do that. You can't bring that stuff in here. It's no good. Let me teach you a different way, a better way. So, how does God do that? I got lots and lots of verses here. We're going to go through them fast. I just I've highlighted the word vengeance. And by the way, this is only a few of them. There are many, many, many more. I just picked the ones I thought were the easiest to, to get the point across. Psalm 58, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the nakam. When is the nakam? Birth pains. Right, in the birth pains. So therefore, what is going to exist in the birth pains? Righteous people. Yes? Yeah. All right. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the nakam. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. That is nasty. nasty. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Psalm 94, O Lord, God of vengeance, El Nekamot. And it says it twice. El Nekamot, El Nekamot. Shine forth, Hophia. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Pay back the proud. How long will the wicked exalt? They speak arrogantly. They crush your people. O Lord, they afflict your heritage. And so we're saying, rise up, O God. Hophia, appear. Come and judge for your people. And remember it says, rejoice, O Gentiles, because God is going to judge his people. Judge, sorry, God is going to revenge for his people, not come, his people. Isaiah 34, and all the hosts of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. You probably know that from Matthew and Revelation, not from Isaiah. You should know it from Isaiah. And the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, for my sword is satiated in heaven. It descends for judgment on Edom. Who is Edom? The Vatican. Rome. The Vatican. Rome. 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 It descends for judgment on Rome, the people whom I've devoted to destruction. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats. It's not lambs and goats, it's people. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah, that's like the capital of Edom, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. And it's not the land of Edom, it's Rome. And it's not the land of Rome either, it's Hellenism in general. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, Yom Nakam. Now he calls the day of the Lord Yom Nakam. It's actually the day of vengeance. That's its title, Yom Nakam. Day of vengeance. A year of recompense for the cause for the cause of Zion. The whole purpose of Nakam is for the cause of Zion. 
the Jews. I'm telling you, that's all that's in the rule book, the law book. That's it. Everything about Israel. That's it. That's what God judges by. Israel. Now, many, many, many Christians have said this without saying it. What they say is something like, Israel is God's time clock. Or something like that. Yeah. I've heard that for many, many years. This is really what they're saying. That all of God's judgments are based on Israel. Yom Nakam. Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the lily. Rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy because God's going to crush human beings and their blood is going to come up to the bridles of the horses. Yay! That's basically what it's saying. Rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. Fantastic. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble and say to those with ancient heart, be, take courage. al tira. Have no fear. Fear not. Why? Behold, your God is coming in Nakam. Vengeance. Nakam Yavo. Your God in vengeance comes. Now this uses the word Yavo. Now Hofia. Hofia means shining, like bright shining coming. Yavo just means literally to come. Is it like a uh, like morning star, like that bright shining? No, uh, real. Yes, but I don't know that. So he says, why? Why are you supposed to be so excited and happy and, and courageous? Because your God comes in Nakam, in vengeance. The payback of God. That's what it says in Hebrew, payback. The payback of God. He will come and save them. Isaiah 59, truth is lacking. The Lord looked down, he saw, he hated it, that there was nobody to do it. Nobody to stand in the gap. Nobody to make atonement. Nobody to, to care for the, the people who need help. Nobody. And so, he got upset about it. He was astonished that there was nobody. And so his own arm brought salvation to him. He put on righteousness, like armor, a helmet of salvation, he put on garments, clothing of Nakam. He's going to clothe himself in vengeance. <laughs> you should see your faces. What? That's weird. Yeah, that's weird. God is going to clothe himself in vengeance. Why? Because we're not allowed to vengeance. We're not allowed to revenge, ever. So therefore, how's Israel going to be taken care of if they can't strike back? God's going to do it himself. Garments of vengeance, garments of nakam, for clothing, he wrapped himself in jealousy as a mantle. According to their deeds, he'll pay back. Wrath to his adversaries, payback to his enemies. To the coastlands, he will pay back. You know what the coastlands is? Anybody Greece. know what the coastlands is? Huh? Greece. Greece. Very good. Greece. Now we're back to Greece and Rome. Yes? I just wanted to say that he says vengeance is mine. Right? Yeah. The Lord. Yes. And he's quoting Leviticus. It says, you shall not take vengeance. Why? Vengeance is mine. We're not allowed to. That's in so, our personal lives as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you do Judaism. Because Jews aren't allowed to revenge. That's the Jewish way. All right? I'm going to read that again. To the coastlands, he will pay back. What's the coastlands? Greece. Greece. Or Rome. Again, we're back to, he's going to pay back Hellenism, or Edom. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion. Everybody loves that verse. 
A Redeemer will come to Zion. Well, this verse is wrapped like an oyster in a, in a shell in vengeance, nakam, over and over and over again. And you can't pull that pearl out and just go, oh, how pretty. It has to be in the context where God put it, which is nakam. Isaiah 63, who is this who comes from Edom? Uh-oh, this is bad. Who is this who comes from Edom or Rome with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah? It doesn't mean a pretty clothing. It means col col uh, garments that have blood spattered all over it. That's the glowing colors. The one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Vengeance is always the same. The Jewish people only stoned if every step of the way they were trying to save. Yes? They're trying to save and save and save. Looking for ways to save. That's what vengeance is. That's what it is. It's the final straw. There is... I tried everything else. All that's left is not come. Mighty to save. Why... Why, God, is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? Because I've trodden the winepress alone. I trod them, people, in my anger, and trampled them, people, in my wrath. Their blood is on my garments. Why? For Yom Nakam was in my heart. You want to have the heart of God? Think about that. Do you want to have the heart of God? Yes. That's what's in God's heart. His love for Israel. And Nakam for those who hurt Israel. Yom Nakam. The day of vengeance was in my heart. Think about that. Yes. You know what, I, I, what the question was, is it's too far a stretch to say that we'll get to know God better. As we're trying to do Judaism, learning through our children and our, our spouse. Like saying, uh, the well, hold, hold on, I'm going to answer you. You're wrong. I thought you were going to say, if we get our minds on the birth pains. That's what I thought you were going to say. That's where you should have gone. God's heart is, the birth pains are in God's heart. Why? Why are the birth pains in God's heart? Why? He looks like you're begging. Because he loves Israel. That's all that's in the law book. Israel, 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 Israel. You want to get to know God? Get your mind on Yom Nakam. Guys, I've been studying the birth pains for 40 years. And it is the thing, I know you don't understand this, and I get that. It is the one thing that has helped me get to know God better than any other thing. It's what showed me pictures. It's what makes me understand God's heart. Is Yom Nakam, the day of vengeance. I know it sounds upside down and backwards. You know, God is love. Yes, God is love, and in his heart is Yom Nakam. That makes perfect sense, though. Like, well, that's because you're a Jew. <laughs> like, obviously, like, if you love somebody, or at least something, or someone that much, like, obviously. Yeah, you if you know, love somebody, you're going to be passionate, and you're going to be jealous, and don't you touch my wife. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> well, you didn't say that. I was trying to, you stopped me. I was trying to expand. saying is, the way you feel about your children, and someone comes against them, or your spouse, you love them so no, you're not jealous for your children, you're jealous for your spouse. And it's not, that's the only thing that would apply. God says it is that the, 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 how do you say jealousy? Kina. Kina. That the kina comes up in him during the day of, the day of the Lord, right? The birth pangs. The jealousy comes up in him for Israel, for his, his bride Israel, period. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with children. I just go with jealousy for a spot. But I'm telling you, this is the one thing. 
I mean, if I had to find one kernel of that could help you to understand how to get to know God much faster, much faster. It's like fast tracking, getting to know what he thinks and what he feels. It's Yom Nakam. I know it sounds backwards, but this is the way it is. Yes? Um, there is a true story in a movie that was made. It's called Plan oh, A. Gosh, come here. Right. It's just too much. <laughs> Get over here. So you're in the car. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Quit complaining and get in the camera. Um, no, I was just going to say, there's a, there's a movie out right now, and it's a true story, and it's called Plan A. And I, I can't remember which streaming uh, company Sorry. has it, but it is about the Nakam. It was an actual group that was formed after the Holocaust, and there was a bunch of Jews um, that got together, and basically they were going and and revenging. Re revenging. Yeah, they were trying to avenge what had been done to them, you know, in the Holocaust to their families. And I mean, it's incredibly sad because obviously they take it upon themselves to do this instead of waiting on God, but I thought that was really interesting because their group was called Nakam. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just thought right. like, it interesting. I am so glad you brought that up. Because in the day of the Lord, it is going to be the Jews who do Nakam. And I'll show you, I'm going to show you that. They were a little ahead of the game, but that's okay. We're not allowed to do Nakam. It was a picture. So he says, Yom Nakam was in my heart. I must say this again. Do you want the heart of God? Yes. David was a man after God's own heart. You like that verse? Mm -hmm. David was a man after God's... I, I hate to hear people say that. Because that's how it sounds. Oh, David was a man after God's own heart. Do you know that he sawed Edomites in half the long way? <laughs> Tens of thousands of them, it says in the scripture. Not this way, this way. He sawed them in half. My man. Why? My man. Why? Because Yom Nakam was in his heart. And it was the right picture. Because they always like, act like you have to love like, even all the people that are that's, doing all the bad things. That's what I said in the beginning. Like, well, because it says love your neighbor. And it's like, no. All right. So I want you to really think about this. This has a lot of ramifications for us. It was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I trod down the peoples in my name. It's in God's heart. And by the way, this is what you're supposed to look like when you're judging. Rejoice, O nations! <laughs> we are about to destroy you. <laughs> right. Jeremiah 46. I'm going to say this again. We are not allowed to not come. God's going to do it. Jeremiah 46, 1 and then 8 through 10. To Egypt, the army of Pharaoh Necho, by the Euphrates River at Carchemish, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon, defeated Egypt. So what happened was Egypt and Babylon got into a war at Carchemish at Babylon, and Babylon destroyed Egypt. And when that happened, God said, see that? This is going to happen again. Verse 8. He has said, I will rise... Uh, Egypt has said, I will rise and cover the land. I'll destroy the city and its inhabitants. Go up, you horses and chariots, that the mighty men may march forward. Babylon, that's Cush, and Libya, and the Lydians. For that day belongs to Adonai. What day? When they're fighting at Harchemish? No, the day of the Lord, the birth pains. A day of vengeance, Yom Nekama. To revenge himself, Lehinakim on his foes, and the sword will devour and be satiated, drink its fill of their blood, for there will be a slaughter for Adonai in the land of the north. So it's going to happen again. It's also going to happen to Edom. Jeremiah 50, this is about Babylon. 
concerning Babylon. Raise the battle cry against her on every side. For this is the vengeance, ki nikmat, of the Lord. Take vengeance, nakmu on her. Take vengeance on her. Well, that sounds like it's going to be people doing it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like God is talking, and God says, take vengeance on her. Who? It's got to be people. Take vengeance on her. As she's done to others, do to her. Put all her young bulls to the sword. Let them go down to the slaughter. For their day has come, the time of their punishment. There is a sound of refugees from the land of Babylon. To declare in Zion, Nikmat of the Lord our God. Nakamah for his what? Temple. Temple. I'm telling you, all that's in the law book is Israel and Judaism, and therefore the temple. Who was the one who destroyed the temple? Babylon. 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 And Edom. And Rome. All right, Ezekiel 25. Look at all the words for vengeance and revenge that are in this passage. Because Edom has acted against, now it's against Edom. Rome. Because Rome has acted against the house of Judah by vengeance revenging. Bin kom nakam. Who did the vengeance here? Who did the vengeance here? Oh, you got lost. Because Edom has acted against the house of Judah, against the Jews, by vengeance revenging. Who did the vengeance? Edom. Edom. Because they did not against my people and has become guilty and avenged themselves, nikmu, on them. The Lord says, I will also stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it and I will lay it waste. I will lay my vengeance, nikmati, on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And that's why I'm glad you brought up Plan A, because that was a picture. They called themselves vengeance, and so they <coughs> did something about it, and they acted out exactly what's going to happen in the birth pains, that the Jewish people are going to be the hand of the Lord that he uses to destroy Edom. Who's Edom? Rome. What did the Nazis call their kingdom they were trying to set up? Right, right. What number? The Third Reich. The Third Reich. Third? third. Why third? Because it's third, the Rome coming Rome, back. Rome, the, the Byzantine, Roman Empire, Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, which is Eastern Rome, uh, Eastern Catholic Portugal. Empire. No, it's an empire, the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, and then the Nazi Empire. That's why they called it Third Reich. They were Edom. And so the Jews said, okay. <laughs> we're going to do God's nikmati on Edom by our hand. We're the Jews. It's a picture. Therefore, they will act in Edom according to my anger and my wrath. Thus they will know my vengeance, nikmati. Now he says the Philistines. Because the Philistines, and by the way, do you guys know what Philistines are? Don't picture Arafat. Don't picture dark Arabic people. Anybody know where the Philistines came from? Greece. Right. It says it in Genesis. Greece. They came from Greece. They're Greek. They started out as Greeks. Then they got into all intermarried with Canaanites and changed. But they're basically at their root. They're Greek. And so God says about Philistines. And if you don't believe me, go do the research. Because the Philistines have acted in vengeance and revenged with vengeance. Bin kama vayinakmu nakam. Three words in a row. They did vengeance on vengeance on vengeance. With scorn of soul to destroy with everlasting hatred. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and destroy the seacoast. There's the islands and the seacoast again. Greece. I will do great vengeance, nekamut gedagot, on them, and wrathful rebukes, and they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance 
on them when I lay my vengeance on them. Now, this is the part I want to key in on. That in the day of the Lord, I'm going to say this again. There's two things going on here. The Jews are going to be God's hand to do the vengeance. Yes? Yes. Why? Because Yom Nikmat is in their heart. And they're going to be like David. Not only that, Gentiles are going to stand by and go, Yay! The cheerleaders. And rejoice because this is going on. And that's what it says in Psalm 149. So the Gentiles won't be a part of the hand, they'll be on the sidelines. The Gentiles who are righteous will be the cheerleaders. The Gentiles who, are, who have hurt Israel and got themselves in the law book, they're going to re receive the nakam. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Yay! Praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. The sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Does this sound like anything having to do with Nakam? I get it. <laughs> dancing and sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. Why? Because the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Oh, we just took a left turn on that one. <laughs> Dancing with a sword in their hand. Why? To lay vengeance on the nations, on the Gentiles. Nekama. Praise the Lord. Dance, sing, have fun. Use the guitar and congas and have fun and have a party with a sword in your hand to lay vengeance, my vengeance, God's vengeance on the Gentile. Punishment on the peoples to put on them the judgment written. Written. This is an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord! Isn't that bizarre? I'm going to say this again. You need to get Yom Nekama in your heart and in your head. So that becomes your focus. And it will show you what the love of God is. It'll take your fear away. It'll get you focused on what he's focused on. That's his focus. It's not bringing the gospel of Christ to the nations. It's the Yom Nekama, the day of vengeance. That puts everything in right perspective. Then the understanding comes of Jews, and Gentiles, and the body of Messiah, and Hellenism, and Judaism, and everything falls into place. Real clean, real neat. But without that, without that understanding, it's always going to be a jumble in your head. It's never going to be clear. This is what clears it up. All right. Now, we're going to go to what you brought up a long time ago, at the beginning of the, of the teaching. But first, we're going to read this. I mean, you're, you're going to recognize what Yeshua, what Yeshua said immediately. But you don't recognize it from the Tanakh. And this is a problem. This is a problem. Ezekiel 34 describes the shepherds of Israel. And it tells God's heart. And it says, God's heart is to go seek after the lost sheep of Israel. Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he's among his scattered sheep. I'll bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, bring them to their own land, and I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel. I'll seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, strengthen the sick. Did you see all those descriptions? I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do that. To who? To who? Who is this? Who are the sheep? Israel. Israel. I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this, I'll do that. To the sheep of Israel. But the fat and the strong, those ones I'll destroy. I will feed them with judgment. As for you, my flock, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another sheep, and between the rams and the male goats. 
So now we have a judgment of sheep and goats. I know you recognize that. Because it's the words of Christ in red. That you recognize. This you don't recognize. This is what you should recognize. So he says, I'll judge between the sheep and the goats. But he says the judgment is, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, and I'll do this for my people Israel. Is it too slight a thing for you that you should feed the good in the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture? He's talking to the leaders of Israel. Or that you should drink of the clear waters, that's the Torah, but you foul up the rest of the waters and make them drink that garbage? I, even I, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, and I'll judge between one sheep and another. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. Oh, isn't that strange? And he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince. I thought he was a king, but now he's a prince, the son of the king. Among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. So this is talking about the Messiah, obviously, but he calls him David. And it says, I will set up David. So, obviously, we're not to judge for revenge, right? Anybody, anytime. Until the day of the Lord. And then only some people. God's criteria is one thing and one thing only. The Jewish people, Israel. How they treat Israel. And that's what this judgment is. How were my sheep Israel treated? Your job is to, if you're a Gentile, your job is to serve Israel. That's your job. Your job is to serve Israel. Period. You want to get to know God? Serve Israel. And you might get on the fast track to know God. Because it's only in Israel, in the doctrines of Israel, that you're going to learn about the things you need to learn about. One of them, the obvious, most obvious one, is the day of the Lord. That's only the only place it's found is in Judaism, among the Jews. So your job is to serve them. And as you serve them, you being in a place you do not belong, that is the fallen sukkah of David that God said he would restore, and he would... Bring back all the Gentiles that are called by my name, he says in Amos 9, and Acts chapter 15. That is proper order. The Jews are restored, and so the Gentiles are afterwards restored. And they come in to serve Israel. That's the place of the Gentiles. But what about everybody else? where the judgment comes. These words you probably know. When the Son of Man comes in His glory. What would that be? Hophia. Hophia. When He comes in his, in his bright, shining beauty. That's Hophia. He's quoting scripture here. He's quoting the verses that talk about Hophia. Hophia to, the ones that we, read, that we sang. Hophia. When the Son of Man comes in His Shining glory, that is at Yom Kippur, not at Rosh Hashanah, at Yom Kippur. Then he will sit on his glorious throne, that's at Sukkot, not at Yom Kippur. All the nations will be gathered to him, and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. That is directly from Ezekiel. He will put sheep on his right, and goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, blessed of my father, inherit the what? Kingdom. The what? Kingdom. Inherit the what? Kingdom. Why does it say salvation or eternal life? Because it's now in the kingdom. He says, okay, you guys get the kingdom. Prepared for you. Why? Because I was hungry, you gave me deep, I was thirsty, you gave me drink, I was stranger, I was naked, I was sick, and all these criteria, and you did to me those things, and the righteous will say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or in prison? 
just like in Ezekiel. I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I'll do this for who? Israel. For Israel, for the Jews. And he says the same thing. They'll say, when do we see you like that? And he'll say, the king will answer, now follow this, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. What brothers of mine? He's telling a story. There's nobody there. So he's quoting scripture. Yes? Yep. He's quoting that passage in Ezekiel. These brothers of mine. Here. Who are these brothers of mine? What do they look like? Jews. Sheep. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jews. Those are his brothers. I've heard this quoted so many times in churches and stuff, teachings on the radio and whatnot, and they always make it sound like care for those who can't care for themselves. That has nothing to do with this. This is about Israel and the Jews, period. And how you treat Israel and the Jews, period, is written in the books. And that's how God judges, period. There are no other criteria. To the extent that you did it to one of these, these brothers of mine, my brothers, the Jews, you did it to me. They don't say to those on his left, get out of here, get out of here. Depart from me into eternal fire prepared for the devil, because I was hungry and you gave me nothing. I was thirsty and a stranger and naked and sick and in prison. Goes through all the same criteria. Then they'll answer, when did we see you hungry or naked or thirsty or in prison, same criteria, and he says to the same thing, to the extent that you did it to the least of these my brothers, the Jews. You did it to me. You did it to God. To the extent that you treat the Jews, that's how you treat God. And it's that simple. Only it's almost impossible to get that into your heart because of the culture we live in. I'm going to say it again. To the extent that you treat the Jews is to the extent that you treat God. And there's no way around it. And then those ones will go away into eternal naka, naka olam, into eternal naka, or at least during the birth pains. So now we have punishment as naka instead of vengeance. This is in this is in the New Testament. Yeah, but the word is punishment. Yeah, the way this are? is in the New Testament. I don't know what it is, but I know in the scriptures in the Tanakh that what he's quoting here is naka. Because I just showed them all to you. So I don't know how this is translated in the, Jew, the New Testament in Hebrew. And I don't care. Because we looked at the verses, so I know what he's saying. And what he said was, those who treat the Jews badly, what do they get? Naka. And so that's what he says here. These will go away into Naka Olam. But the righteous into Chai Olam. Eternal life. All right, I've tried to make this as clear as I can. I tried to cut it short, I tried. Um, but I want you to think about one major thing. If you're a Gentile, your job is to serve Israel. And remember we looked at it on Rosh Hashanah, the word is serve, servant, Evan, and it is the most important thing you can do on this planet is to serve the Jewish people. Because if you do that, you are then in right relationship with God because that's what he set up. And you're in right relationship, hopefully, with yourself because that's what's God, what God has called you to. And if you're not in alignment with what God's called you to, you're not going to be happy. You're just not. 
You can fight it all you want, but you're not going to be happy. That's the way God set it up. The Gentiles, Edom, is to serve Jacob. What does that mean? That means you get to come in all the way to the altar as a servant carrying water and wood all the way into the temple to the altar. You don't even belong near the temple. And yet you're invited all the way in where you do not belong. And you get to come in close to God. That's pretty amazing. And if you're a Jew, you have got to get your mind wrapped around Yom Nakam. You've got to. You are not allowed to do vengeance in this world. You're not allowed to hold a grudge in this world. And I'm saying this specifically to Jews. You are not allowed to hold a grudge with anybody ever. It's the hardest thing to do. But if you've got the fact that there's Yom Nakam in the future, <laughs> it makes it easier to do it with. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, do you use the word not come and use the word not um, ikum and another one? Um, anyway, kam, which is in basically all of kam, kum, it's arise or stand up, which is basically like what we learned of. Okay, it's going on now. Okay. <laughs> you can't do this, Eileen. It's got to get on the table. In what we were learning was nakam and nikum, that part of the word where it's come, okay, is arise or stand up. It has to do with standing up, which is also like uh, when we say kumi, arise, my beloved, and come away. So we, it's an action, and you arise and come away with the Lord, but you're also arising for naka, for that vengeance, when you are a part of being the beloved, part of being the bride. That's all I was going to say. Okay. Oh, very nice. Thank you. That's why we pray. That's why we pray. We pray to get God's, if he needs to do vengeance, because we're not allowed to. Yes? We stand up, we rise up, we look up, we pray. And then hopefully God stands up and rises up and does what he needs to do on our behalf. I didn't even want to bring that up, but that is absolutely the truth. I mean, I'm in that position right now. I need God to stand up on my behalf and bring a little naka. <laughs> so do you. Me yeah. too. So do you. Yeah. So perhaps right after service, we will pray for some of that naka to come uh, on our behalf. Let's pray. Let's pray. How about thank you that you share your secrets with us, that you don't hide yourself completely, but you share your heart and your ways with us, that you shared with Israel for thousands of years. And I ask, Father, that you open the eyes of your body more and more and more to these amazing treasures that have been hidden amongst your people. And I ask, Father, that you would show us by your spirit how things work for us so we don't have to go on what we've been told and what we've been taught, what we've heard our whole life, which is just silliness. I ask, Father, that you teach us your way so we can know a better way. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Let's uh, let's stand for the Alain. Alain, yes, sir. Do the Alain. Let's do the Alain. Alain, let's share with the Adon Hacho. Let's get the love of your servereshi. Shelo sanu kegoye ha araso. Velo samanu kemishpachot ha adama. Shelo sam kelkenu kahen. Vekor aleinu kekol hamona. Let us adore the Lord of all. 
who in greatness created the world from of old, that he has not made us like the nations of the earth, nor has he made us like the families of the land. He has not made our destiny like theirs, or cast our lot with all of them. Va anachnu korin, umishtakabi umodi, lifnei melech, malachei hamlachi, hakadosh baruchu. And we bend the knee and bow in worship and give thanks to the King of Kings, the Holy One. Bless thee. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.